Hello, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on the part of the world that you are connecting from. Welcome to day four of the Virtual Island Summit. It is a pleasure to um, be presenting this session titled The Race to Renewables, Redefining the Potential of Economic Prosperity Through a Just Transition. My name is Christian Sakino. I am the Chief of Staff and Technology Lead here at Island Innovation. I am originally from Marida Island in the Caribbean, but I'm currently in the beautiful coastal city of Vigo in the Northwest of Spain. Before we begin, you should see a poll that is going to appear right now on your screen, right? So uh, we want to get to know you better. Please let us know what region you are connecting from. We have all regions represented as usual. And also, if you scroll a little bit below, you will find options to select your sector and your industry. So please take some time to answer our poll. And I also want to invite you to use the chat function to introduce yourself and where you're joining us from. Uh, you can also make any comments during the sessions, but regarding questions, please make sure that you use the Q&A function. And we will do our best to make sure that we can address as many as possible on the Q&A section that is after the presentations. In the unique context of islands, the transition to renewable energy sources presents both unprecedented challenges and extraordinary opportunities. This session is going to explore how islands around the globe are at the forefront of the renewable energy revolution and how they can harness these changes for sustainable economic growth and social equity. Now let's see, uh, I see a lot of people participating on the chat uh, from many different parts of the world, Scotland, Sudan, the UK, Spain, Mauritius, Cape Verde, welcome everyone. A very global contingency as we have it on all of our sessions. I'm going to share the results of the poll now. So I can see, and we have the time zone advantage, of course, that the majority of the attendees here are from Europe with 56% of you from uh, uh, Europe, uh, but followed closely uh, by Africa. We also have people from the Pacific, from Asia, from the Caribbean, which is very early in the morning in the Caribbean. So we appreciate that. And we also have people from North and South America, and the Indian Ocean. So it is wonderful to see probably most of the regions of the world represented here on the uh, session. As far as the sector goes, uh, the majority of you come from the private sector, but we also have a large con contingency of people from the academia, almost 30%. And we have people from NGOs and the government sector as well. And as far as the industry grows, most of you come from the energy sector, and it makes sense because this is an energy uh, session, a renewal session, so it's important that you are all here. But we also have people from the environmental services, ocean conservations, management consulting, circular economy, and we have a session coming up uh, today about that. Tourism, we have a session about that on Friday. So thank you for joining us here today. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our moderator for the session, Mr. Steve Peters, Senior Energy Specialist, Waste to Energy, Energy Transition, Energy Sector Group at the Asian Development Month. Steve, you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, loud and clear. Super duper. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the invitation from Island Innovation, and I look forward to hearing our presenters today. Um, I'm Steve Peters. I'm also the project lead on the Mares project. I'll share the link with you in the link about that. And Island Innovation kindly supported us in uh, some of our activities in that. Um, I'd like to move straight on with the panel, if we could, um, and introduce His Excellency Edison Rayner, the Special Envoy for the BES Islands for EU and UN Economic uh, Development with Latin America and Caribbean. Um, Excellency, would I call on you to make your presentation, sir? Thank you very much. It's an honor. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Edison Reiner. As mentioned, I am the Special Envoy 
for the best islands towards the EU, UN, and economic development in Latin American and the Caribbean. Um, it's an honor for me to be here today. Um, I, let me say I'm original from Bonaire. I work for the three islands being Bonaire, St. Eustatia, and Seba. But actually now we are streaming out of The Hague, where I am currently attending several meetings with Dutch ministries in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, let me start by explaining some of the, uh, the words that I'm going to mention in this presentation. When I say the best islands, I refer to Bonaire, St. Eustatius, and Seba. Those are three Dutch municipalities in the Caribbean. And uh, these are part of the Dutch kingdom. And I, here you can see a, in my screen a graphic form of these islands. The bigger one is Bonaire, and the two other ones are the Saba and Stacia. Um, the Dutch kingdom consists of four countries, being the Netherlands, Aruba, Curaçao, St. Martin. So as I mentioned, the best islands are Dutch municipalities in the Caribbean. Furthermore, as my uh, role as a special envoy, Together with my team, we focus on three areas, that being the United uh, European Union, uh, the United Nations, and also the economic development for uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean for the best islands. Um, let's focus. Uh, let me now go over to, uh, we, we focus on these three um, areas, and let me explain a little about our relationship with the EU. The European Union um, the, has 13 OCTs, which stands for Overseas Countries and Territories. These, 30, these 13 OCTs are six, six Dutch islands, six French islands, and one island from Denmark, is, which is Greenland. Uh, specific funds toward these islands runs through all 13 governments. Besides these uh, funds, we have also the horizontal funds available for these islands. And these are based on strategic uh, lines from the EU, amongst other green deals, the global gateway for to mention a couple. Um, Latin American Caribbean special attention has special attention from the EU because of the geopolitical geopolit choices of the European Union. Um, let me continue by also describing a little about the United Nations. That is very interesting for the best islands because they're busy with the strategic development goals and they also provide technical assistance to implement these SDGs in the islands in the Caribbean. Um, last but not least, the other team we're focusing on is the economic development in Latin America and the Caribbean. This is also, of course, uh, development in general for these six islands uh, and then we have uh, referring to these islands we have focused islands which uh, we have uh, uh, business going to do businesses which are Dominican Republic, Colombia, uh, the USA, uh, being Miami, Panama, Trinidad and Suriname and the other countries in the Dutch kingdom as you can see on the slides are the Aruba, Curaçao and St. Martin. Specific topics which we are going to touch uh, today, five teams from um, the, as, uh, the special invites and its team will uh, deal with is climate change, connectivity, food security, sustainable energy and water sources, and also the economical diversification of our islands. On all these themes, we are working with islands and also with international stakeholders. It is nice to mention that we are busy together with Island Innovation and Mr. James Ellsmore to write proposals for an EU program called Clean Energy for EU Islands. So that's a, that's a very interesting project together with uh, Mr. Ellsmore. Uh, let me mention also the added value of my cabinet for the best islands translate into improvement of relations in the region, the strength and presentation of the islands at the EU and UN, and the creation of financial opportunities through a targeted commitment to horizontal funds from the European Union, and also closer coordination with the ministries in the Netherlands on various themes that are important to the islands. And of course, there's a lot more that I can tell, but uh, I, considering the time that I have, uh, I will have a 
very good use of it. And as we speak, uh, we are building a website of, of the special envoy, and it also started with newsletter later this year, which also will be provided. Um, the URL, URL of this website will be cabinet special envoy.com. So we'll take a look later on, and if you can see if we can start to posting things on that. And I expect it to be live by the end of this year. Um, of course, you can always uh, register here to there to stay updated with the latest news of our developments, and uh, we will be more than happy to receive you there. Um, concluding, I can I want to thank the Island Innovation and also Mr. James Elsmore for this opportunity to speak. And I would like to thank you all for listening. And as we say in our local language, Masha Masha Danke. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency, and thank you for keeping us on time. It is much appreciated, sir. Um, for the next speaker, I'd like to call on Mark Hull, Chief Technical Officer for Community Energy Scotland. Mark, you've got eight minutes. Cool, Steve. Just going to share my screen. You can see that fine. Cool. Right. I'm assuming you can see my screen, Steve. I haven't, I haven't had a confirmation for anyone. Yeah, really. Yes, you can. Go ahead. Brilliant. Okay. Sorry, that's cool. Right. Yeah. So, um, I said it was a very long title, but I think I really wanted to focus on the power of island communities and 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 power and what it means in, in a Scottish context. So, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm Chief Technical Officer at Community Energy Scotland, based in Orkney, the Archipelago of Orkney, off the north coast of Scotland, part of a charity that works specifically with communities and, and, and have a lot a very high island presence. We've got 25 staff across Scotland, 10 in Orkney and a majority in the islands working on them, member-based organization. And we, we've, we've worked for about 20 years supporting communities um, to take responsibility to help them thrive and work together. Really for this talk in particular, I really wanted to focus on the principle of the climate crisis that we face. And slightly controversial, I'd actually say it's not electrons or even, even climate changes that are our current problems. We're frozen in a heat wave. We are in an emergency. No one can deny it really now, to be honest, or very few can deny it now. We're seeing so much evidence of it now. And if we're honest, we've actually known about it for a good while. That's the ExxonMobil study for 1970. We know the problem. We know most of the solutions. You know, we have this thing with the development goals framework. That's what can you do yourself as well. Um, we have the information. We also, from island specific uh, perspective as well, have personal and cultural memory of living before oil. But actually on this graph, this is just a global consumption one from an energy point of view. 1950 was really when it really, when we really started to get really out of balance. It's in, it's in living memory of people that still surround us. And most people want to do the right thing if they can. I think that's really key but yet we don't act. Global justice is the key. I don't want to underplay that. It's absolutely key. Um, there would be no issue to make change if there was no pressure, no, no resource limitation. But I think another reason, another reason we're finding through our work and our island work is so much is not seeing and having the trust in what we each can do and the path to action. And I think we've been lucky in Scotland and been, in many ways that we've learned with our island action movement that we've had over the last two decades. So we say, can island energy, community energy help us show that way? Three years ago, I've, I, in another session, I, I used this slide. It's the island behind me on the screen, actually. It's Hoy, um, one of our members as well. And we talk about resource on the edge. That's the, the cliff of Hoy for north and west um, pan panorama. Over a thousand feet high, we get the sense of how raw we are. We feel everything. We see everything coming towards us. It's also a human landscape on the edge. A slight apology, I'm aware of this is someone's interpretation of a Disney view of Polynesian and Maori um, um, mythology and culture. But fundamentally, once you see the shape of that, and you, you know the shape of the island, you don't unsee it. The Hoi themselves have a community organization, an anchor organization themselves, and they live on it. And this is their, this is their logo. So Hoi is a human place, islands are human places. And in Scotland, we really have this sort of concept with two key ones of being hefted. It's when animals, stay in their area of the, of the hill and the land where they don't actually move and go anywhere else. They don't need to be fenced in. They know where they are. And the idea of Duchess is a Gallic idea. It's connectedness and interrelationship between land, people, and culture. And I think that's really, really key. I hate the word glocal, but it sums up a lot of what islands are. We know where we feet are, but we're where we see how islands are. We're we move around. And it's important to avoid traps of localism. 
um, glossing over things too much, but knowledge, ownership, and the interrelations of place is an asset and strength for us, I really think. We have, we're working on a project, and there's people online today from the, the Carbon Neutral Islands project, where we have this idea, our island communities are sometimes the world writ small, remote locations to some, but often the first to experience these challenges. And we have these island systems which can create specific challenges for resilience and mitigation. And a sense of identity and self-reliance that helps increase the sustainability of action. We don't want to be seen as living laboratories, but the nature of our thing allows us to do things where we can, where we can shine the light for all. And we have this idea about being lighthouse communities. It was very dry, it was, it was born out of land justice. In Scotland, we had a, a, a huge inequity across land and land ownership. And the community buying the land buyouts at the time, most of them were islands. And not only were most of the islands, when you have the own of your assets, you have a responsibility. They developed community energy projects to both have them, to own both the problems and the solutions to how they then manage their estates and their own communities going forward. And that became a wider social justice movement in Scotland. And again, very heavily adopted by islands across Scotland, where all of these ones are owning and running their own facilities, their own services, energy connected, but all from that point of view, but then generating their own revenue, their own energy, so they can have they can have continuity, they can have resource, and it creates this trusted local actors for community-led, long-sighted planning and action. A whole community approach, also a holistic approach to change, and so this community energy isn't just about generation, isn't just about use. You start thinking about systems and the other aspects of it. I'm skipping through because of time limited. And Orkney's got a reputation, as uh, Steve mentioned when we were in the session before, or I almost worry too big a reputation, there's a lot of activity, a lot's been happening in Orkney. But I want to just quickly pick on one particular community-led project where there have been four islands involved. We've been working on this idea of Heat Smart Orkney, where we have our own generation that's limited by the grid, limited by the infrastructure. If we export too much, they turn us down, they turn us off. We did a project where we worked with our community, we worked with our householders. We realised we had an asset in everyone's house that we could actually keep more of that electricity, keep the value there. We did it smartly and we balanced it. We kept the generation going, we kept the turbine going and we created and we monetized it. And that was the thing, it was the Heat Smart Only project. It's a phenomenal project. It's run for three or four years. It's still slightly ahead of its time, but it shows the power that you can do when you take on your own responsibility. I think that's really key for us. I mean, community energy is not just electrons. We've just had our um, annual conference yesterday and we've been going through a lot of where we are and where we go forward and so much of what we do like these projects is think about infrastructure economic contract policy behavior culture but it, it, it and all these aspects and it, 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 of the different uh, energies throughout our lives so we have these projects now that people work on affordable warmth health and well-being inclusive mobility local growing is an issue especially in the more, the more northerly latitudes waste handling where where communities take the responsibility to do their own um, handle their own waste and training we touch on the need for skills and these islands from the point of view, but community ownership of solutions leading to lasting action. So I'll say quickly to some, yeah, so what the, this is really the last slide to sum up. What we've learned from Community Energy Scotland's work with island projects, we've learned that community energy often relies on a sense of place and recognise the commonality across diverse and difference in communities and across islands. But trust, that trust in local organisations and with local delivery partners, enablement, normalising and de-risking the new so people can act. And I'm here to really sort of say community ownership of action solutions may be the best, possibly only way that we can have both rapid, yet just an inclusive mass transition to decarbonise. And island communities in particular can show the way. That's me. Thank you very much, Steve. I can, there's a rush through that and we can take more in questions, but I promised I'd do it under seven minutes, so. Thanks, Mark. I very much appreciate it. We've had a slight change in program, but uh, we're saving saving uh, uh, the Honourable uh, Julie Thompson, Thomas, Chief Minister for St. Helena Government to the last. And now we will have Juan Manuel Reventa Perez, the CEO of Finova Foundation. Juan Manuel, the floor is yours, sir. I'm trying to switch on my video. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Juan Revuelta. I'm the general director of the of the Finova Foundation. We are in Brussels, we are in Mercosur in Santiago de Chile, in Panama, and also in we have an antenna in Lisbon, in Tenerife, mostly in Spain. Anyway, 
In seven minutes, I, I'm going to share with you three ongoing projects in the field of sustainability in Iceland. Uh, when I'm talking uh, now of these concrete projects, uh, what we are focused is in EU funding, LIFE, Horizon, Interreg, but also with, uh, with Latin America, with Asia, we are working also in uh, what is um, Triangle Cooperation and Horizon Europe. Anyway, I'm going to, to um, share with you some of these uh, slides. Okay. Um, um, allow me to explain. We are now in, in a wonderful period. We are to, to working in the field of next generation, what is the, the biggest EU funding, EU, uh, sorry, the biggest economic recovery plan in the history of the humans. I'm talking of 13 times what was the so called the Marshall's plan. Anyway, what we are combining is how to obtain innovative pilot projects for sustainability in Iceland through EU funding that can, after we can uh, transform in, into a next generation a structural plant or also, in, for example, the life program in Latin America. Anyway. One one more your slides. Oh yeah, good, terrific. Your slides are changed. Sorry, sorry. Okay. This is the flight program. I love a lot because of the uh, uh, world sustainability. We are talking of for this period. We are in the period. Uh, we are in the period that will end um, and with the rule plus three up to it has a start 21, 27 plus three, 23. That means 30. We have a lot of funding to, to use. Here we have 5.4 billion euros into euro, but you have for the people connected from third countries, you have a lot of uh, good projects that you can, with other EU funding, you can, we can, um, uh, we can implement in Latin America. In Africa, we are in some projects in Africa or in Africa. Anyway, we have here Life Cost Adapter. It's a just, uh, just approved EU funding project, 3 million, almost uh, half. And it's, it, this pilot project will be in the Gran Canary Island. It's a project in the field of adaptation of climate change. As you can imagine, we have different universities and enterprises to work. try to deserve the cost of the impact of the climate change. And here you have some prototypes that pretend what we are going to do in the next, it will be a project of seven, eight years of, of uh, time uh, to implement. And then with the university and some companies, we are going to install this, uh, this, this installation that also is circular economy because we are reducing the waste from the real estate and building uh, to, for this structure that pretends to, to uh, defend the cost of, the, of, the, of all the, the strong uh, ocean because of the climate change. You have different pilots here, and we will try to share the info that we learned here with other islands and also with other funding. Life ecodigestion eco is another ongoing project. We have very good, uh, very good results. It's just how to reduce the digesters from the depuration water treatment facilities plants to do what? To digest other organic plants in the, or, or organic uh, waste in the island from Oreca, hotel, restaurants, and catering, supermarkets, or from the farms, pigs, larry, etc. To do what? To produce in a sustainable way more biogas for consumption. Did you know that uh, in all over Europe there are 18,000 depuration water treatment plants that consume three percent of the total energy in Europe? Okay, that's a digestor. We have. If someone wants to visit, we have all the information. We have with the EU funding. We have create uh, 
digital twin and with artificial intelligence we have all the data in how uh, in the in how uh, how is the gas that we produce from the slag from, uh, when we mix with pig slurry or with oreca to do what to transform every depletion water treatment plant in a digester of the organic waste in the island after we have a uh, bio uh, we have of course an structural waste after all the process that we can reduce in bio agriculture and finally we have here to tourism is a five is a, is a four million euro project Corme cooperation small and medium enterprises for the future of tourism uh, uh, what we are going we have uh, some partners as island uh, from islands like menorca in the balearic islands and the idea is uh, we have 36 months. It has started 15, 15 of these months. Yesterday, European uh, Day of Tourism, we have present in Valencia. But the idea is to identify the best 60 small and medium enterprises from seven countries to accelerate in the first phase. They will receive each 20,000 euros. And after, um, we will have um, a process of scaling up helping them to networking to uh, of course to have access to you funding in, in that field you have my mail uh, we will be more than than happy to work with you in the future and that's it also we, we are in, in uh, uh, starting to work in some islands in latin america thank you thanks juan manuel that was very kind of you um, now I'd like to call on the honorary, uh, the honourable Julie Thomas, Chief Minister for Saint Helena Government. Ma'am, please accept our apologies for the problem of getting you connected and getting you out of order. But, ma'am, I'll give you the floor now. Are you okay? We can't hear you. Hello, I'm here now. Can you hear me? Absolutely. The floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you. So hello everyone. It is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to come back and have the opportunity to speak in this virtual summit being arranged by Island Innovations. I would firstly like to wish you a very happy fifth birthday and offer you congratulations in always striving to achieve your three primary goals of innovation, collaboration and positive change. From listening to the speakers that's gone before me, I think St. Helena Island we benefit from some of your connectivity um, because it seems you're very much more advanced with your renewable energy. So I do hope you listen to what I've got to say today and will be able to help us on our journey. So to provide some context and give some background to St. Helena Island, I will begin by saying that we are a small island of 47 square miles geographically placed in the South Atlantic Ocean, some 1,200 miles west of southwestern Africa and 2,500 miles east of Rio de Janeiro in South America. We are one of three constituent parts of the British Overseas Territories that um, consists of St. Helena, Ascension and Tristan de Cunha. My government has been in post for approximately two years and our vision for the island is to achieve a sustainable environment that creates opportunity and inspires social and economic progress, ensuring a better quality of life for all. At the heart of our vision, there are three main dimensions, which is our environment, our economy, and our social obligations, our people. To enable us to achieve our vision, our priority policies focuses on specific areas, which we believe are instrumental if we are to address our current challenges impinging on our ability to create a more optimistic and viable future for our island. One of these priority policies is to strive to maintain and improve our blue and green agenda, aspiring to become a blueprint for others to follow, as we are proud to be the home to a third of Britain's biodiversity. It is therefore important for us to embrace the innovative, collaborative and positive change approach, as we recognize and understand how important renewables are to the future of our islands, but just as importantly on the global scale. 
So a little bit more about our island. St. Helena currently generates 21% of its electricity supply through renewables, wind and solar from the grid. We are committed to ensuring that renewable energy plays a vital role in meeting our future energy needs and supporting a low carbon island and economy. Unfortunately, as many attending the summit will no doubt relate to, improving upon the status has its challenges. But despite setback over the last few years in terms of contracting with the party to help us to realize this aspiration, we remain committed to achieving our end goals, which is now to achieve 80% of our energy demand from renewables by 2027-28 and sooner if possible. This is supported by the establishment of a renewable energy policy for the period 2023, so from now until 2030, which was endorsed um, last month. This renewable energy target set of 80% is necessary to ensure recognition is given to our renewable sources being highly weather dependent and therefore energy supply from other sources will be utilized to match demand from the grid. This is important during periods when power from renewables, including from a battery energy storage system, cannot sustain a baseload to meet energy requirements during peak periods. An 80% renewables target has been chosen as it is the most viable option for St. Helena, where it is likely to be the most commercially affordable when compared to a 100% target. Our proposed renewables project would see our utility service provider design a renewable system for an external supplier to deliver and operate. This option is open to any form of funding contribution or funding relationship. The specific design will split into phases and specific components to enable ease of using different funding sources and approaches. So I'm hoping that those of you listening, if you think you can assist us, by all means get in touch. If adopted technologies to be employed are the already proven solar and wind systems, a battery energy storage system will be necessary to stabilize changes in energy supply and demand. At present, we do not think, do not know, sorry, the mix of wind and solar that will make up the renewables infrastructure as research continues in this area by our utility service provider to inform the design feasibility element of the project. And just to give you an idea of where we are at this particular time, so phase one will be the design feasibility and the objectives is in the short term is at minimum to maintain existing levels of electricity generation from renewable energy resources. This is essential in light of concerns around our aging infrastructure, given anticipated, as anticipated timing to deliver the renewable energy project, consideration needs to be given to extending the lifespan of some of the existing infrastructure. Complete design feasibility and procurement preparation for the renewable energy project. To minimize risk to this project, we recognize the importance of initiating early procurement preparation and the need to complete the assessments required to update a request for proposals prior to tending. Tendering, sorry. SHG, St. Helena Government, and the utility service provider has drawn on external expertise over the last six months for technical and policy advice on our utility provider's energy delivery plan and assisting us in producing our renewable energy policy. This support has been appreciated and gratefully received by both entities. We are committed to developing capacity for an experienced workforce to deliver our renewables and a renewable energy project manager will be sought to join St. Helena's utility services provider team. Further external technical capacity will also be sought through consultancy for specialist renewable energy design input for electricity demand modeling and incorporating recommendations of the power system study into final design and tender documentation. This government will act to ensure security and resilience of the energy network to support this reform, we are working closely with our utility service provider and the utilities regulatory authority to update our current electricity ordinance and accompanying regulations. Both are outdated, having been published prior to the use of renewable energy. 
Key considerations will include reviewing provisions around regulating standards within the energy sector and specific provisions related to renewable energy. Energy transition is a global issue and St. Helena's commitment to this is reflected in our 2016 energy strategy. There is potential for positive publicity by joining other small states that have given the same commitment, but also potential for St. Helena to access funding from sources designed to support this transition. Our renewables journey offers opportunity for St. Helena to develop and tell a good news story around renewables. However, it is recognized uh, that ensuring appropriate planning and reforms is key to ensuring that we are successful and can tell such a story. And then we'll obviously go on to phase two, which will be the implementation of the project. But I just want to end by giving um, a key, some key milestones for those interested in part, um, partnering with us. So by the beginning of next year, we would hope to have a specialist renewable energy design input through renewable energy consultancy secured for our utility service provider with all necessary assessments completed by March 2024. And RAC will then commence on the design and tender documentation for the project followed closely by the procurement process beginning with the desire for a contract to be signed by the end of 2024. It is anticipated that physical works will begin in 25. Again, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share with you the aspirations of St. Helena in our journey into becoming a greener, more sustainable island. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That was great. Um, I, I grew up hearing about St. Helena and you're the first person I've ever met from St. Helena. So today's a bit of a oh, first for me. <laughs> um, it, it's very interesting. Could I ask everyone, the panelists, to turn their cameras on and... Um, and there might and just leave your microphones off for a moment. I'm going to call on you one by one. But um, it's very obvious that the conditions for innovation and the need for renewables is different in all of these locations. And islanders sort of have a imperative to do it themselves because most people don't really understand what it's like to live on an island. Um, and you know, someone who lives in a big city doesn't really get it. So when you talk to people who are financiers from a big city, they don't understand that sense of self-reliance and that sense of otherness that, um, you know, is part of being an Islander. I What I'd really like to do is if I could call on His Excellency uh, Special Envoy Edison Rayner. Um, Special Envoy, could you reflect on a little bit about the challenges that Islanders have for renewables and, and some of the opportunities in your work? You'll probably see that some things that are... Um, make things happen faster and some things that make them happen slower. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on that, sir, given that you were the quickest person in the panel. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, the challenges we had, let me start with saying that um, the island of Bonaire used to be a uh, front runner uh, regarding uh, the energy, sustainable energy in the early, like 20, 30 years ago, 80% of our electricity were produced by windmills. And because of the island's growth, explosive growth in the last 15 years, that has been reduced to 44% because we didn't uh, catch up with the, uh, the population growth. Uh, and that's the reason why now we, together with the help of uh, the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the uh, European Union, we're making the transformation into solar power and also more uh, windmills to get back to the 80 percent and the challenges we're getting now is um, this scarcity of um, resources in the world uh, the ukrainian war has uh, made the prices go up again as well and um, so we are facing now much more uh, expensive uh, much more uh, funds are needed to reach the same goal we we put set forward a couple of years ago but uh, Thank, uh, we are very fortunate that we can um, uh, look into the direction of the uh, European Union for that. And it's not only Bonaire, like islands like St. Eustatia and Saba are already 80 to 90 percent sustainable for um, uh, the sustainable energy. Wow. Um, oh, my God. Let's speak. Yes, good. Um, can I call upon Juan Manuel um, just to to carry forward on this discussion 
that some of the technology that you have is commonly employed. For instance, digesters are very common throughout Europe. Do you Did you find that there was a problem with getting people to adopt those and getting the people who were training or teaching people how to use digesters to understand the conditions on an island? Can't hear you, Man Juan Manuel. Yeah, I can hear you now. But you've gone off again. Okay. Uh, now better? Sorry, Steve. Yes. Okay. Of course, every innovation requires um, requires training. First, politicians, of course, civil servants, and it's part of every project. Innovation means to, uh, to do things in a different way. It's not so easy, but okay. People now, I, I, I find people is more open than ever for that. Um, about um, innovation, digesters, of course, is something that that is um, that we know what's that, but it's not so evident that is in every depuration water treatment plants. And innovation sometimes is not in the technology of the digesters, but in the big data in how to 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 transform other waste in the operations of, of every depuration water treatment plant. Thanks, um, sensor, thanks, artificial intelligence, or thanks, this digital twin, for example. But anyway, what, what we have in Europe is a lot of quite interesting technologies to transform that in green hydrogen. We have a lot of technologies. We have a lot of funding. We have a lot of needs in Iceland. It's a question just to try to to connect everything to do in, in, in projects. And in my opinion, EU funding is not just the money. For me, for, for, for us, it's a smart money. Uh, that institutional support of the flag of the European Union help uh, politicians and mayors and so civil society to say, okay, some, someone from outside is supporting this innovative idea that's uh, as we okay and, and do you see that the um in in our work at adb very commonly we're asked to look at capability development which in some ways means uh not just t t explaining to people what it is but actually physically showing them that and getting them to put their hands on it and as they say in australia kick the tires um before you buy the car um, do you find that that is helpful when you go through and do your transfer, technology transfer and, and learning? It's not just useful. You need that. It's because of that pilot project. So is that. We start always in, a, in every project with a pilot project. And of course, we have different focus groups to work with. For example, we have, uh, we have Girls for Tech uh, in, in any... In, in the project Life Eco Digestion, we have we launch every year a challenge at the schools, and then uh, children understand that, and and then communication is easier, and it helps to for that for that uh, communication and sensibilization. The schools is is quite interesting, and of course uh, videos. Of course, uh, we we try we try to work uh, in in every school. We launch different. A challenge every year linked to EU funding projects. And you cannot imagine how children can convince their parents or their yeah. professors yes. in, yeah. in helping in changing behaviors. Yeah. It's that sense of being connected, I think, is very, very important. Could I call upon Mark to talk a little bit about um, to take that forward about capability and especially the point about engaging not just men but women as well and kids. You know, when you're in a small community, it's all hands on deck, right? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, I was listening to the man well, and um, a lot of the presentation focuses on the, the Scottish islands, um, where Scottish islands have been very advanced and have done a huge amount of innovation over the last um, 20 years. But we've been fortunate enough um, to also work with... Um, um, sub-Saharan communities and Eastern Indonesian um, islanded communities as well, Steve, just looking for electrification. 
and I think, yeah, absolutely. As, it, as I was saying, it's not just electrons. I think, I mean, the Satolo project is probably very, quite good one in Malawi. I'm, I'm coming on land a bit too cheekily, but I think it's really important where actually we embedded the, the users, the engineers, all in the process from the beginning for the point of view that, and some of it is competence because we have to be reliant, even, even islanded grid, microgrids, even without water around them, have to be self-reliant. And that is really, really important because we just we can't just call up someone to come down from down the road. But it's also by doing this, there's a lot of what I touched on this. I, the more I do it, it's a more subtle thing. It's about a sense of self and ownership and familiarity. People will cross the road for something that's strange sometimes. But if they've, if they've got that, as they, if the kids know about it, if they've gone along and they said, right, we're going to be one of the users in this. And, we're, and, and that's often, and especially in places like Malawi, a lot of female headed um, households are also the main business runners. And they'll have the bottle shop, they'll do, you know, from that point of view. And, and getting those in the room and, and, and around the room. And it's just that, it's a weird thing. It's a sense of ownership because it's ours, which you get from that, which actually does stop. It actually enables people to do it. Whereas we, we're, all, we're all the same. We'll all, we'll all stand back and watch the neighbour and see if they're going to fail first in small communities in some ways. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that because I was just about to lead with the next point was I was lucky enough to sit on a call where um, your surf and turf project was presented yeah. to the community yeah. in Palau. And yeah, yeah. what was really interesting was the Palauans were like, yeah, these people are islanders like us, right? They're not city yeah. people trying to tell us how to do something. These are these are people like us. Yeah. So, um, oh, completely. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't I was out of context in that sense. But in a small community and not myself, you are you're very conscious of your neighbors and you're watching we have the opposite effect we talk often about meerkatting which is that it was it was there was a, there was, a, there was a sort of there was a, there's a media thing going on where and but it's that thing that people look up and see what the neighbor's doing you know what i mean and it's actually that that is a really effective way and a really positive way that they see oh so and so's doing it that's a good thing and those local trusted examples are always very very strong yeah so i'm going to throw you under the bus now because uh, Chief Minister Thomas has said, hey, you know, we need to do a bit of stuff. You know, is it a case of Islanders helping Islanders? You know, you carry the same passport. Mm. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> Sorry, yes. Is that to me, Steve? Yes, <laughs> yes it is, because yeah. I, I yeah. think uh, yeah. Chief Minister yeah. Thomas has made a, a pretty very, a very good case for come and, yeah. come and help us and come and get engaged. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And we, and, we would, and we are. I mean, we would be delighted. I'm, I'm in the chat. And I think... I, I've been lucky. I've been lucky and fortunate to work with great partners more in Europe than, than elsewhere. But islands have island communities have much more in common than any than any national barrier that ever that's ever put between us, Steve. Completely, and you you yeah. find that, and you're in a room, you're in a meeting. Even if we're face to face more on this call, you suddenly you, you just see very very quickly this, the the common barriers and challenges and solutions that come from just speaking to each other and working together. Hundred percent. So, Chief Minister, I suppose the question is, how would you think, uh, what would you like the, the folks in the Orkneys to come and help you with? And do you reckon you could get it done? Thank you for that opening question. I think, um, Mark, yes, you put your foot right in it. And I can tell you there's no meerkatting happening here on St. Selena. When you um, look at how isolated we really are, there's no neighbours to peep over the fence and see how you're doing. <laughs> so we need yeah. to go right first time round. Yeah. Um, and then obviously the other thing I didn't say in my um, my intervention was that St. Helena is very, is very financially aid dependent on um, British government, hence the reason we are looking at um, financial options that is affordable to us, and but also working in synergies with um, islands or businesses that are very much about our blue and green agenda. So as much, um, we've got a lot to tell here on St. Helena, but right now our electricity might well be one of the most expensive in the world. And it's uh, impeding our ability to progress um, and being highly dependent on diesel is not the ideal situation for us when we've got everything else that shows uh, links to sustainability. So happy, Mark, to be able to put you in touch with the Minister for Environment, Natural Resources and Planning. So happy to give you um, contacts for um, her and her portfolio director, who's very much taking the lead on this. But then I've also got other ministers 
with responsibility for economic development. So uh, we're very much aligned in pushing for the blue-green agenda. And the very next thing on our to-do list is the implementation of renewable energy for Sintelina. That's awesome. That's fantastic. So um, yeah. that's great. I mean, we've got an outcome from this panel just by being here. Could just I to, ask? Quick, can I be cheeky just quickly? There's a second chance to dig myself out of the hole. No, when I'm talking about meerkatting, it's within communities. We often have situations where we have a technology that we put in and people want to carry on doing what they're doing until they see it working. And that's the meerkatting. It is within a small community that we do it. It's not, there's not between communities, but it's a really powerful way of that sort of having a trusted example within your own community. And people trust it because they know that person or that person's going for it. So, you know, and, and that, that counts so much more often than in communities like St. Helena and our own communities. I'm too Yeah. Does that make more sense? Yeah. So I'm going to call on the, His, Excell His Excellency, the uh, Special Envoy, to close this panel out. And I'm going to close, ask him to address one question. Um, Island Innovation is a very interesting organization. It has it solves a, a so, uh, engages in a unique proposition that islands uh, can be engaged for islanders by islanders, um, and we saw just in the last ten minutes that discussion. Um, Your Excellency, what do you think we could do better? Um, thank you. What we could do better is collaborate as islands. I mean, we have the uh, same challenges, um, the same, uh, uh, the, we face the same dangers, climate uh, changes, things like that. So I think if we cooperate, we can uh, show more unity to inst and institutions like EU, United Nations, and other countries, which can uh, then be of assistance to the islands uh, and also coastal uh, cities around the world. Uh, to to act as one and and and, and uh, reach for goals that we all are looking for. So collaboration will be the word I will like to to use. Yeah. That's a that's a great reflection because I think as an outsider, I grew up in a city and I we had a property in the middle of the desert in Australia. So I'm about as far from an islander as you can get, except that I'm from Australia, which is still apparently an island. Yes. But um, yeah, apparently being the operative word. Um, so what I'd like to finish this panel off is just some reflections on some of the really interesting points. The minister made a, uh, chief minister made an interesting point about one third of the biodiversity for the UK is on that, on their island. That's amazing. Um, and the, the renewable energy targets are also very aggressive and that's good. That's great. And, you know, Juan Manuel's talking about some really very interesting technology in the circular economy to adapt to adapt to coastal change, but also to make use of natural resources and bringing in those technologies and normalizing them in the community. Um, and Mark talked a little bit about that sort of self-sufficiency, you know, these range of small programs and people picking them up and, and making them their own. And of course, I wanted to finish off with um, the special envoy who, who basically said, we, we've got to cooperate. And uh, so um, I think this has been a really useful panel, and I I would just ask the um, the panelists, and I'll I'll go in order of everyone who presented so that we get everybody presented. But I would ask if you could do one thing, what would you do? And in, you got thirty seconds to answer to make your island more resilient. So. Um, uh, uh, Your Excellency, you're first. Uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> I will like um, energy transition. Um, that will be definitely what we're doing right now. And besides that, we are also looking into the, the, the food um, security that we also want to be sustainable and uh, produce self-sustainable food production on our island. Those will be the two most uh, important uh, parts. And also, like I mentioned before, the cooperation between all the other islands and such uh, platforms as this one will be very, very important to keep uh, uh, informing each other and uh, making a, a fist to be together. Thank you. Making a fist, I like that. Mark. 
Yeah, okay. I think I go back to my presentation. I think um, we're somewhat fortunate being in, um, in, in the UK and in, in, in a developed area. And we have this situation. We can't say we don't have the, we don't have excuses to for act. We have, but we have this thing that we're all frozen. And I want to work and support and give my my island individual citizens the the confidence to unfreeze and to just just a small change, just use less and things like that. I think that's key, and we can we can achieve a huge amount by doing that. So feel the resilience. Yeah. Okay. Well, well. Mm. We still can't hear you properly. The idea is, to, in my opinion, we have to develop an open mind attitude to facilitate ideas from outside. Cooperation is a must. EU funding helps, not only for the funding because of the institutional support, political support. And in my opinion, the word is circular economy. That is also waste to energy, but water, quite important. and. In, from the tourist perspective, what about the textile waste that is also a way of creating new jobs for reusing, upcycling the, the textile from the tourism? We are working a lot in that field. And for, for me, the, the big word is circular economy in every aspect, eh? plastic waste, organic waste, water. Thank you, sir. So it's about being open to innovation which sometimes we aren't. We're a bit scared by it. Chief Minister, you've got the floor's yours, ma'am. What do you want? 30 <laughs> seconds. Well, I'll say what I started off by saying, and that is what our vision is, and that is for a sustainable environment that creates opportunity and inspires social and economic progress, ensuring a better quality of life for all. So we need to build capacity here on St. Helena and ensure that we get renewable energy that is affordable to allow economic growth, sustainable economic growth, I may add. Yeah, that's great. Look, it's been an absolute pleasure to meet all of you today. Um, and I've seen some of the comments in the chat, and I agree with just about every one of them. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, everybody who's spoken today. I'd also like to thank Island Innovation and um uh, Sarah or Christian, would you like me to hold, hand back to you? Thank you, Steve, and thank you to our wonderful panelists, Honorable Julie Thomas, His Excellency Edison Rigna, uh, Mark Hall, and Juan Manuel Revuelta for your participations today. It has been an amazing session. We are seeing a lot of comments in the chat and also on social media, so thank you for attending this session. Now, for all of you that may have missed it, uh, we announced it on our opening sessions um, the other day, we are partnering with the government of Prince Edward Island to host the first ever Global Sustainable Island Summit in Canada next year. It's going to be a two-day in-person summit in May 2024, where we will be discussing solutions and advancements in sustainable energy. Please follow the link that you will see on the chat. My colleague Maria is uh, adding that information right now. And uh, get your discount code BIS2023 to get a super early bird discount. Valid until tomorrow, until uh, Friday, sorry. So please um, go ahead and use it. Next up, we have the Island Agenda at COP28 and the Road to Seats 4. This session is coming up at 9 a.m. New York, 2 p.m. London, and 11 p.m. Sydney time. And later in the day, please do not miss the Island Sustainability in the Round, Exploring Circular Economy Sessions. That's coming up at 11 a.m. New York, uh, 4 p.m. London, and 1 a.m. Sydney time. So thank you so much. See you in the next session.